I mix what I like. I mix what I like, what I like, what I like, what I like. The book that I've written that most tried to talk, to frame my, my concern with popular culture to a more general audience is the collection of essays, Outlaw Culture. And, and in the beginning of that book, what I say is that students from different you know, class backgrounds and ethnicities would come to my classes and I would want them to read all this metalinguistic theory and of difference and otherness and they would say, well, you know, what does this have to do with our lives? And I found continually that if I took a movie and said, well, did you go see this movie? And like, how did, how do you think about it? And I related something very concrete in popular culture to the kind of theoretical paradigms that I was trying to share with them through various work. People seem to grasp it more. And not only that, it would seem to be much more exciting and much more interesting for everybody. Because popular culture has that power in everyday life. My mom always said life was like a box of chocolates. You never know what you're going to get. Whether we're talking about race or, or gender or class, popular culture is where the pedagogy is. It's where the learning is. And so I think that partially people like me who started off doing feminist theory or um, more traditional literary criticism or, or what have you begin to write about popular culture, largely because of the impact it was having as the primary pedagogical medium for masses of people globally who want to, in some way, understand the politics of difference. I mean, it's been really exciting for someone like me, both in terms of the personal um, desires I have to, be, to remain bonded with the working class culture and experience that I came from, as, as well as the sort of Southern Black aspect of that. And at the same time, to be a part of a, a diasporic world culture of ideas and to see how, how, how can there be a kind of interplay between all of those different forces. Popular culture is one of the sites where there can be an interplay. My own sense is that the, the most enabling resource that I can offer as a critic or an intellectual professor is the capacity to think critically about our lives. I think thinking critically is at the heart of anybody transforming their life. And I really believe that a person who thinks critically, who you know, may be extraordinarily disadvantaged materially, um, can find ways to transform their lives um, that can be deeply and profoundly meaningful in the same way that someone who may be incredibly privileged materially and in crisis in their life may, be, may remain perpetually unable to resolve their life in any meaningful way if they don't think critically. As someone who's moved from teaching at very fancy, private, predominantly white schools to teaching at an urban um, predominantly non-white campus in Harlem. And, it, and the first thing I noticed was that my students 
were equally brilliant in, in the Harlem setting as they were when I taught at Yale or Oberlin, but their senses of what the meaning of that brilliance was and what they could do with it, their sense of agency was profoundly different. Um, you know, when students came to Yale, they came there knowing that they're the best and the brightest and they think that they have a certain kind of future ahead for them. And they, they in a sense, w are open to embracing that future. It has nothing to do with the level of knowledge. You know, it has more to do with their sense of entitlement about having a future. And what I see among my really brilliant students up in Harlem, many of whom have very difficult lives, they work they have children, um, is that they don't have that sense of entitlement. They don't have that imagination into a future of agency. And as such, I think many professors do not try to give them the gift of critical thinking in a certain kind of patronizing way. Education just says all these people need is tools for survive, for survival, basic survival tools, like their degree so they can get a job. And not, in fact, that we enhance their lives in the same way we've enhanced our lives by engaging in a certain kind of critical process. All right, welcome everybody to another edition of I Mix What I Like live right here at Black Power Media. I'm Jared Ball, happy to be your host. Uh, big shout out to, uh, Josh and Aaliyah, the, the, I mix what I like crew who are helping, uh, improve the, the show, uh, and for helping out this morning as well. Um, as I continue to struggle also with some of these technical difficulties that I haven't been able to quite figure out yet. But, uh, um, I did want to start today with, uh, uh, that little clip a little bit from Bell Hooks. We're gonna talk again with uh, Dr. Niasha uh, Grayman Simpson this morning about uh, the influence of Hooks on her work. Uh, and then in the second hour, we're going to, in a similar but slightly different direction, be joined by DC hip hop legend, global hip hop legend, Asha Roo, uh, famously of the Boondocks theme song, but so much more than that. I just know that that's a, a, one of the more popular uh, uh, you know, uh, uh, one or more of his popular contributions. So we're gonna we're gonna, uh, uh, but uh, uh, talk with him about a number of different things in terms of hip hop, his career, touring, the politics of the industry, uh, his work with Guerrilla Arts as an educator. Uh, there's a lot to 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 the brother. So we uh, uh, and perhaps even a little bit about Bell Hooks as well. Um, uh, so, yeah, but I did want to start with that because uh, uh, for a number of different reasons. And again, uh, you know, greetings to everybody who's here live, those who will join us later on. Uh, we appreciate you. Uh, those who will hear this on uh, whatever their favorite podcast platform, we appreciate uh, you listening uh, uh, there and then as well. Uh, please do engage um, with comments and uh, uh, your responses and thoughts. Um, and of course, uh, invite others to join you uh, and to to continue to uh, support this show and more importantly, the platform. Click like, join, subscribe and get the bell for all your notifications since there's so much happening on the channel later today, later tonight, over the weekend. Uh, some things that might just be popping up. Um, I can say uh, next week in terms of the Remix Morning Show when, when the whole crew is back for your Boom Bat Breakfast, uh, beyond just me trying to hold it down for the crew, uh, we have a number of uh, we have uh, a, a number of guests already coming through scheduled. Uh, 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 some good folks uh, in the All African People's Revolutionary Party doing some podcasting. We're going to talk with them about their work. Uh, Dr. Joy James is going to come back, uh, I believe, Wednesday morning to join the morning show. Uh, look forward to that always. We have uh, Dr. Tommy Curry is going to be with us a week from today on this show. Uh, he'll be back with us. Because, uh, uh, by the way, there's no, I don't, you know, 
personally, you know, all due respect to whoever's whatever, the holidays, these holidays, you know, don't mean that much to me personally. So they don't adjust my schedule too much. So we'll still be doing our thing um, on what some will be calling Christmas Eve. Uh, uh, others might recognize as the winter solstice, whatever your preferences are, we'll still be providing you some good content here at I Mix What I Like and Black Power Media. So, you know, uh, uh, happy holidays and happy Kwanzaa and, and all those good things. Um, and whatever you celebrate or don't, we'll still be here. <laughs> um, but I did, you know, uh, anyway, as I said, uh, we're going to talk a little bit more about bell hooks, but just for my own part, cause I, I don't want to take up the time when, when, uh, uh, um, uh, our dear sister, uh, comes through, uh let her do her thing um and i think she's much more familiar with hooks's work and has engaged it i think much more deeply than i have um but but in terms of my own work hooks was in that clip there alone demonstrates her, uh, uh what for me was um uh, a tremendous influence how to engage uh class the classroom popular culture uh how to make use of it why i'm so interested in being critical of it uh, despite whatever my, my particular thoughts of it may be, uh, uh, she exemplified that that point very well. And and something that I find, and and on a much le different level, have experienced myself, having attended and taught a little bit at elite PWI institutions, uh, teaching now for uh, um, going on my. 17th, 18th year at, at, at Morgan State at an HBCU, uh, where we engage mostly working class diaspora, African diaspora, and, and a lot of Baltimore East Coast uh, born and raised uh, um, Africans, Black Americans. Uh, there are obviously differences, but not at the level of intellectual capability. The differences are most prominent in uh, the preparation various students have gotten uh, and preparation to succeed in this particular educational system, um, which is something very different than potential or capability. Uh, and, to, and to the point that Hooks makes in that clip, it, uh, uh, specifically the attitude elite whites bring to uh, the uh, to the classroom and their educational experience and their expectations is very different. Uh, now I've certainly come across my share of of uh, you know in many ways I you know without trying to to disabuse them of some of their fantasies, there are some wildly um, uh, mythologized black students that come through my classrooms with expectations of of the billions that they'll make and the levels of of success that they will attain. Um, but I think more more to Hooks's point, in general, there is an overriding and certainly more than I saw at PWIs, an attitude of uh, um, of lowered expectations, of uh, of I'm trying to get to just an improved position. I'm trying to work around a horrific situation, uh, and I just want to make some basic improvements. And when I would, when and I do almost every semester, ask students, "Well, what, what do you, you know? Why are you taking this class? What are your hopes? What are your dreams?" I'm, I'm no longer shocked, uh, um, and almost more accustomed to the responses being very individual, very specific to to. Uh, uh, um, a minimal material improvement for the individual or maybe their family. That is, I just want to get a good job. I just want to get, you know, get this degree, get a good job, you know, make a little bit of money, get some health care, you know, do something better than, you know, something my, my family hasn't been able to do, et cetera, and so forth. There's no expectation of, of genuine power and rule that, that I certainly saw uh, uh, at, at some of these so-called elite PWIs. Um, where even the buildings and the architecture is meant to intimidate, um, but the the but when you get past the veneer, the actual capabilities are no different. 
uh, the opportunities are different. The previous prep prep preparation and opportunities for preparation are very different. But uh, um, so I really appreciated how Hooks approached that. And often would be the case that that you can bring students into, quote unquote, deeper levels of engagement when uh, uh, often by starting with pop culture. Uh, they're already engaging it. They're already using it consciously or not to uh, inform their work and their worldview. So it, it, to me, it is, it is almost essential that we be willing to engage uh, despite, you know, uh, again, I'm still suffering the PTSD of the co-authored book chapter I did some years ago about Tyler Perry, uh, where, where obviously to, to do sound work, I had to engage his work. And uh, it's traumatic, and it's certainly traumatic to engage that kind of work in in um, you know binge type settings. Uh, it's just it's just being inundated with that level of 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 trauma is 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 you know again relate leads to PTSD, but but I think we have to do it. And Hooks has always been somebody that has inspired me in terms of how how to do it. Uh, doesn't mean, we, again, it's not about always agreeing. And I've seen a lot over the last couple of days on Twitter. Uh, and one that stuck out to me was in response to uh, our, one of our, our guests this morning's tweets. There was somebody that said, uh, basically, if Marimba Ani don't like her, I'm done with it, too. Uh and I get that. I have the greatest respect for Mama Marimba, but I think that that it does us a disservice to not engage people's work or to not find, uh, in some cases, value in people's work, even if it doesn't rise to the level of, of those we might prefer. Um, but uh, and I think it's important, even if you end up agreeing with Mama Marimba, it's important, I think, as almost as an intellectual exercise, if nothing else, just as training, that we engage all of the work that we end up being critical of. I don't think it's enough to say I'm not going to engage Bell Hooks because Marimba Ani doesn't like her or agree with her. Uh, I think it would be better, even as an exercise, as intellectual training, to engage the work of Ani and Hooks and to see why there are differences, to understand those differences. And then you might even see where the value is of, of, of the one that you are being more critical of. And I, and I don't think we can um, uh, deny the, 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 the impact of Hooks and her value. Uh, and again, as I said yesterday, and I'll wrap my, my comments here on this, is that if you can go at Oprah, saying that Oprah wants to suck the dick of white culture, <laughs> if you can go at Henry Louis Gates, if you can go at Madonna and the broader media structure and white feminism, I think uh, um, it's, it's, it's point scored for me. <laughs> anyway i saw a brother cop bob popped in pop back out he'll, he'll join us here in a couple minutes uh as will uh uh dr niasha uh grayman uh simpson uh i'm expecting her any moment now in fact i'm just going to check very quickly to make sure uh she is good and uh, and there's Brother Kaba. So good morning, my man. How you doing? Uh, let's see. Whoever said that the other day that Bell Hooks is the godmother of Black feminist pop culture critique was 100% correct. Right on. I I, I think that's legit. Uh, anyway, Brother Kaba, man. Good morning, man. Uh, um, what's going on with you, man? How you doing today? I'm I'm well, man. Good morning. Good morning to the family. Apologies for being late. You know I'm a. I don't have all my my normal equipment with me today, so I may not sound as as broadcast ready professional. But uh, you know, we're gonna work it out. Okay, all right. Um, it looks like is there? Why do we have a delay? Are we? A, is there a, a a lag there? Anyway, um, not for it, me, it but looks it, like the it, it may be because where 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 I am, the, the it's not the, the internet's it's kind of rough in here. So okay, that might have okay. Something to do with it. All right. Anyway. Uh, so we'll see. We'll work it out. We'll work it out. But anyway, did you have any thoughts on on Bell Hooks's passing? There was there was um, 
in fact, if I can just real quick before you do that, let me do because I, I keep forgetting to do this. Uh, because we, as we mentioned on the Remix Morning Show this week, we didn't just lose um, Bell Hooks. We also lost uh, Greg Tate this week. And it was, and I was reminded mm-hmm. that uh, um, how much use uh, I had made of Tate's work in my own over the years. And this here is uh, the the model that I use not only for my dissertation, but um, and I mix what I like, but but that I still use when I approach my classwork. Uh, um, uh, and I think that it's, it's still how I see the, the, um, the media in our, in our, in this society, in this world, for that matter, still, still, uh, being our government, is our, our government, our that's right. Well, our astronauts, you know that's plant. right. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> exactly. Uh, our society. they got you, but, they but, got you. Uh, <laughs> you know, and unfortunately, it is our society, whether whether we're in control of it or like it or not. I mean, but but you're right. I mean, sometimes I slip up. You know, I I'm get caught up in my own. You know, we, hey, we look, I'm subsumed within. In this, this is the the point. So, just very quickly, uh, 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 my argument is that as Karl Marx said, that the uh, the original um, sin of capitalism is commodity formation or the commodity fetish, uh, turning anything into something you could buy, sell, or trade. Greg Tate would later say that African people in the United States were the original commodity and original commodity fetish. And I think that, that weds intellectually, uh, um, who's, am I doing that? Who's doing that? Doing what? Is that Josh doing that? Josh, are you making the adjustments here? I, I didn't want to keep this up on the, st- on the screen. Um, there we go. Yeah, 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 thank you. Uh, um, anyway, so, so, so Tate, and I, and I think that that sets the relationship ideologically in terms of what we are presented with in this dominant media environment that, that, uh, uh, capitalism turns everything into a commodity, black people, African people are the original commodity and commodity fetish, uh, uh, that, uh, sets the, the relationship as it must appear, uh, in media, if nowhere else. Uh, Downing and Husband said that racism is the conceptual original sin of the United States. And they argued, as many others have, that that this re- this requires uh, this le- or aids in what is already our humanity's general uh, encouraged uh, trajectory of defining ourselves not by who we are, but by who we are not. So that white people must project an anti black image for their own self-concept. And then as Marimba Ani and, and Amos Wilson have argued similarly, uh, that the destruction of African culture among black people is a political necessity. So all of that. And then it was in that work that I, that, that I remember where, where I learned the word panopticon from Greg Tate and this idea that, that white people are, are performing uh, an attempted perform or are attempting to perform blackness to replace that performance without black people being involved and leaving <clears throat> black people to sort of be outside looking at all of this in a panoptic panopticon view without themselves being seen even as their performance is being mimicked uh and seen through white behavior and and, and performance but anyway it's all part of of a need for white people to perform a version of blackness that makes themselves feel better so i e i e anyway I just, <laughs> elvis i mean Probably justin a Bieber, whole lot of eminem justin timberlake Britney spears you know, uh-huh. adele justin timberlake i mean the list goes on and on and on and on and on um uh, and as Tate wrote back then with everything but the burden, this has been something that white people have been zi- desiring for as long as they could, the, the performance well, you know, of blackness G- without black people. So, well, G- Gil, anyway. Scott Heron said, Gil Scott Heron said that white people had to create Elvis because they, they couldn't have white girls creaming over no black dude, you know, wiggling That's around right. on the stage. You know, so. That's exactly yeah, right. Same thing. That's exactly right. Uh, um, and then, and, and I, you know, again, I see the same thing playing out today where course, you look of at, course they, of uh, course there was, of course the white girls were still, was still doing that over the black men, by the way. <laughs> you, well, of course, I of mean, <laughs> because even they see that, you know, what is a copy is just a copy, you know what I mean? Is it live uh, or is it never So, right? 
So listen, let me. Our next guest, or our, our, our first guest, rather, is here uh, to to continue our discussion and uh, the importance of of bell hooks. And again, we're, we're going to welcome Dr. Niasha Grayman Simpson, who, among many other things, is the Henry S. Delaney Professor and Associate Professor of Psychology and Africana Studies at Goucher College, up the road from uh, or or down the road from where I'm at at Morgan State. Uh, and we welcome her back to the program. It's good to see you again, Dr. Niasha. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Are you able to hear me? Yes, loud and clear. All right, perfect. If you don't mind, I'm actually going to start with a few deep breaths just to kind of center myself and ground myself. Sure. No problem. And again, welcome. Uh, I know that you wanted to to talk a little bit about the importance of bell hooks and her influence on you. Um, I've I've given my two cents on on that. I'm happy to 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 hear yours. So please take it away. What what was that influence, and how do you incorporate her work in yours? Oh, her influence is manifold in my work. And I I think the occasion of her passing, her transitioning and being in the process of joining the realm of the ancestors made me think about something that I think about this season every year, the season as we enter into winter solstice, the longest night of the year and how we cope during the solstice season. And so it was... It was her death that made me reach out to you and ask if I could just come on for a few minutes and talk about some tips or just some ideas of of ways to cope during this season. Mm. One of the first things I found and one of the first things I would recommend is actually going back to the writings of Bell Hooks because she had a lot to say about dying death, grief and mourning. And I'm gonna read a quote from her book all about love, new visions. This is from chapter 11 and I invite viewers and listeners to pick up that book if you've never picked it up, um, all about love, new visions, or pick it back up if you've picked it up and reread chapter 11. I'm thinking the first time that I read this chapter, I was in graduate school and was not involved in grief bereavement therapy and work. And so rereading it now lands very differently. But this is from chapter 11. Our mourning, our letting ourselves grieve over the loss of loved ones is an expression of our commitment, a form of communication and communion. Knowing this and processing the courage to claim our grief as an expression of love's passion does not make the process simple. In a culture that would deny is the emotional alchemy of grief. Much of our cultural suspicion of intense grief is rooted in the fear that the unleashing of such passion will overtake us and keep us from life. However, this fear is usually misguided. In its deepest sense, grief is a burning of the heart, an intense heat that gives us solace and release. When we deny the full expression of our grief, it lays like a weight on our hearts, causing emotional pain and physical ailments. Grief is most often unrelenting when individuals are not reconciled to the reality of loss. And that's from chapter 11 of All About Love, New Visions. So one thing that I recommend as a coping practice during the winter solstice when 
grief waves are more likely to hit very hard um, during this season is a return to the written word, to people who have walked the path before us, who give us guidance and direction on the phenomenology of grief and how to survive it and how to how to deal with it, how to cope with it. Um, a second tip that I have is to follow <laughs> some social media accounts that deal with grief support. One of my favorite accounts is on Instagram by the unapologetic grief coach out of Michigan. And she is running a daily coping with grief during the Christmas holiday. But I think again, thinking about the season and the winter solstice, I think it's applicable to the time period, whether you celebrate uh, Christmas or not. And so every day she's posting a tip, you know, reminding us to cry, reminding us to breathe, reminding us to practice, engage in ritual, which would be my third tip, is to practice rituals that you, your culture, your family has around grief and mourning. And if you have none, develop some. You can develop them and this, you know, there may be different perspectives on whether, you know, it's appropriate to develop ritual with yourself or does it have to be done in community? My personal perspective is that you're always in community, even if you're a solitary person in a domicile, your energy is part of a community. So engaging in ritual that is meaningful to you. And ritual is really important because it acts as both a container for our mourning, the outward expression of our grief, and also a portal for release. So for those of us who do need to continue to function in a world that's in a society that's not very amenable to giving us proper time for grief and mourning, like other cultures, the engagement in ritual can be really helpful in, in that respect. And then thinking about some grounding techniques, because one of the things that happens typically during a grief wave or a grief burst, as we call it, is that our sympathetic nervous system is highly activated. And one of the things that we may want to do is engage in activities that help to calm the sympathetic nervous system and soothe the parasympathetic nervous system, some grounding techniques, starting with the breath. So that's why I started even this, this time with you, um, focusing on my breath. If you can get your cycles of breathing down to five in a minute, you've probably tapped into the mechanism that allows the parasympathetic nervous system to be soothed. If we were to, you know, kind of time your cycles of breath now in and out your nose, depending on whether or not you practice uh, pace breathing, alternate nostril breathing, these kind of grounding breathing exercises, you may be breathing as high as 19 cycles, 15 cycles, 19 cycles a minute. That kind of tells you that you're actually very activated and that the grounded body is breathing more like three to five cycles a minute. So focusing on your breath, if you don't have a deep breathing practice, start to develop one using soothing sounds, sound healing, like I had playing in the background, helps to facilitate the grounding and the centering. Another grounding tool that you can use, I put one on for today, these little, is a spiky ring or something that you can touch with. We can also use ice. We can use uh, uh, fidget gadgets, things like that. But something that brings you back to the body. Because one of the characteristics of being overwhelmed by grief is dissociation from the body. And so something as simple as a little trinket, which I got from um, a distributor that shall not be named, because this is, I mix what I like. <laughs> <laughs> but they come like in a pack of 10. <laughs> mm. But just having this on sometimes and rolling it back and forth 
can bring you back to the body. And then as I used with the breath, um, some type of aromatherapy, oil, the olfactory sense is, is one of our oldest scents. And so the, the use of that coupled with the deep breathing can be very calming. So um, those are a couple of self-help tips. And of course, I want to add that if you're experiencing persistent thoughts of your own death, or the death of another loved one, suicidal ideation, uh, suicidal thoughts. If you're experiencing um, persistent difficulty sleeping, nightmares, um, extreme sense of fear, startle response, and or flashbacks, those are all indicators that it's time for you to reach out for some kind of professional therapeutic help, a licensed counselor or a licensed therapist. Um, that it's not the time to uh, try and bootstrap it on your own, just from a mental health perspective, because those, those behaviors, those activities of the body suggest um, a, a cluster of behaviors that we in mental health might call acute stress or traumatic stress. And so um, again, as a, as a Western trained mental health provider, I would say, go and tap into uh, a Western trained licensed therapist to help you with that, who can also help you navigate using your insurance to help pay for that healing. Mm. <laughs> so those are, those are mm. just a few things that I wanted to make sure that your audience had in terms of um, going into the season and managing the season, which can be really difficult. Bell Hooks is, um, I mean, for me, she's like a she's like a virtual because I didn't know her personally. Um, mentor and intellectual godmother. You can I wrote this, uh, you know, on my social media posts. You can see her influence all throughout my own scholarship. Um, she inspired me in my first position out of grad school at the University of Delaware to initiate a research project on Black love. That was a direct follow-up to reading her trilogy on love and particularly salvation, Black people in love. And it's been a major kind of philosophical foundational influence on my intellectual work around Black positive psychology it has been that text, salvation. I have been to my surprise, I guess, because I didn't know her personally, although I should know better, knowing what I know about how grief works, have experienced multiple grief bursts over the past few mm -hmm. days because grief can be cumulative. We know this. And so the passing of someone you feel an effective connection to can also open a portal to pent up grief you didn't realize was there. And so I think um, her death then just opened the portal to grief of learning about a friend's mother's death a friend's cousin um, dying suddenly and tragically in Atlanta, being hit by a car after having a car accident. Just all things mm -hmm. that maybe you think you've processed and kind of addressed, but grief has a very funny and persistent way of letting you know what is, is still left undone, which Bell Hooks tells us as well. So I encourage, go back to her readings, read, all about love, read what she has to say, um, practice grounding techniques, follow other uh, professionals who are giving a ton of wonderful free advice on platforms like Instagram and um, reach out for professional help if you need it. This can be a very difficult season and also a very beautiful season the night and no I, I definitely appreciate all of that i haven't uh um i don't think any of that work from hooks i, I don't i've engaged any of it i haven't read any of that i'm i'm only familiar with uh and have only really focused on her her you know media cultural criticism her more overtly political work writing and and presentation etc um so i really appreciate that uh this is and this odd uh, this is the second time this week it's been suggested to me that i and my comrades intentionally uh seek out a cry um uh 
And I admit not to having, you know, I don't have the most appropriate response to that. I haven't, I don't think, you know, like I, I was even just thinking as you were talking, I don't think I've cried. Like I was, I was busted up a little bit over, over Glenn Ford passing and trying to, to make some comments about that. Um, uh, but like a real cry, it the last time I could remember was it actually happened publicly because of something our dear brother wrote in support of at the time, uh, um, you know, when my, my uh, second daughter was born, she had some, some breathing issues <gasps> and was hospitalized. <sighs> and I had to give out, I, I happened to be uh, across country giving a talk and he wrote something. I'll never forget to see that he wrote something that I read from the podium at my talk. And as I was reading it, I broke, I completely like, the floodgates open. Mm -hmm. And then I remember, man, I remember what brought me back was this white dude in the audience, because I made a reference to Kwame Ture. This white dude in the audience had some some snarky comment about Ture. Mm -hmm. And it snapped me right back into my anger. And then I could, you know, put the tears <laughs> away. But but I was mm -hmm. like, but anyway, but but just in what you were talking about, just thinking about, you know, my own, you know, I, it's been it, it, it doesn't come easily. And mm -hmm. I and I think, you know, I'm like many others who who resist. Uh, maybe more than we should just to, the, to let it go. So I appreciate that. And I appreciate you bringing up uh, uh, the other parts of Hooks's work that I'm certainly not familiar with. Uh, um, but uh, yeah, anyway, and I yeah. know that this time of year does, does evoke a lot of these emotions in people just generally. Yeah. And cry um, doesn't have so. to be, I, I do want to give the message that, um, not crying doesn't mean that you're grieving wrong. And I think that's another popular mm. idea too, that people express grief in many, many ways. I think what's more important is getting in touch with your expression of grief, how it mm. comes out. It, does it come out in a way that is cathartic or does it come out a way that refuels and pins up the grief? I know some people um, who don't cry, uh, maybe they sigh a lot. And mm. they've come to know that that's an outward expression. It's comparable to maybe my cry, is if they're taking a deep, <sighs> you know, it's almost like a collapse and mm. a release. Mm. So um, getting in touch with how your body grieves. I mean, thinking about the tears, there are three different types of tears and the sorrow tears are a particular type of tear. There's a chemical in them that I learned that does actually facilitate the body's experience of catharsis, right? So, you know, we have tears. Sometimes we cry laughing. Sometimes we mm. cry just in reaction to elements, you know, as like a blinking and kind of a flushing. And then there are sorrow cries that have a different chemical composition that is thought to believe facilitative of, of the cathartic experience when we have a good cry, as people say. Um, mm. But we have, we, we have different ways that our body will try to release that tension and release that sorrow and express mourning. And my goal is um, to encourage us during the season to tap into that. You know, I, I think, I think that's very important what you just said in terms of uh, different ways of, that people express, you know, their, uh, their sorrow. I, you know, one of, the, one of the wild things I was thinking about, as you said, that was so many comedians who end up, we find out, were very depressed. You know, your George Carlin's, your Robin Williams, your uh, Richard Pryor, you know, and I can remember there's this one, I forget, I forget which one of the, this, I think it, it was, I, I listened to so much Richard Pryor because he was just so phenomenal as a storyteller. I love comedians in that way. But one of them, he was talking about white folks and he was joking. He said, he, he just stopped. And it, it was almost like it occurred to him as he said, he said, well, y'all some cold motherfuckers, man. He, did, he said it like that. And you can hear the anger, you know, when he when he was when he was when he was said that. And it's like, wow. He and I, and, I, and immediately when I heard that, I was like, he's expressing his pain through yes. the comedy like yes. that. That's how he does it. Oh, yeah. And I think a lot of us do that. A lot, a lot of us try to escape, you know, pain, so to speak. But I don't even think it's an escape now that you say that. I think it's more of an expression through comedy. Mm -hmm. A lot of times mm -hmm. we, we want to seek out comedy. Um, or, or just be funny ourselves, you know, just to, as a way to express that. And I think, you know, in this culture, emotions are almost like penalized. You know, it's like this idealized notion in this culture is like, I'm a Star Trek person, the old school Star Trek, mm -hmm. you know, 
and and that whole Mr. Spock piece, he's really more of a kind of an avatar for an oh. idealized, you know, man in the Western sense. You know, mm -hmm. that Vulcan, you know, no mm -hmm. emotions, you know, you gotta mm -hmm. be, but even but even but even he at sometimes breaks down and just loses it, you know, from yes. time to time. He, and, and just and just uh and just goes off because he's just tired of holding in all his all his all these emotions. And it's yes. this idealism around just suppressing emotions and and we get affected by that a lot in this yes. culture. You know, I, I know for myself, you know, my wife passed going on seven years, uh coming up next year, early next year. And so I, I was one who never she was always you know, tell me, you know, uh, you know, if you don't get out there and start doing something, you know, to express yourself, you know, I'm gonna kill you, you know. So Uh oh, do he freeze right there? Froze for a moment. Not right there. But we know he'll be back. And, yeah. There we go. Okay, we you froze we right when you said if if you don't do something, she'll kill you. I think I think he's frozen again. All right, hold on. Let me let him get him. Let me let him unfreeze and come back. But uh, um, uh, yeah. Anyway, I mean, even just in terms of of what he was just sharing there, I mean, that was. Uh, 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 yeah, and I don't, I don't, I, there's some levels of grief. I appreciate what you're saying this morning because there are some levels of grief I know that have been experienced out here that I have uh, um, really no, no way of, of, of properly understanding. Um, and yet uh, um, at times find myself struggling uh, enough with, 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 with just my own, what's on, you know, going on around me. So I, I definitely appreciate that you and, and Brother Kaaba would uh, um, not only share some, you know, uh, uh, whatever personal, but also share some of these these responses uh, and ways to to deal with it. Uh, but anyway, yeah, brother Kaba, you you froze yeah. right as you were saying yeah, your wife would, would, would say she would kill you. <laughs> right. Yeah, Start yeah. where from your wife would kill you. Go ahead. <laughs> <laughs> so you know, she would she would just tell me I needed to get back into into music because I, I I hadn't been doing music for a long time, yeah. and so she's actually the person who was responsible for me. Uh, getting into music because she understood that as an artist, I needed that as a as an expression, as a way to express you know myself in in all kinds of ways. And it's interesting because my mother did the same thing when I was a little boy because I used to have a lot of uh, they, what they call behavioral issues in school, you know. Mm -hmm. But I, I just I just like to think I was a very active and you know uh, ebullient child. You know, I was right. very precocious. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, you know, but, but yeah, you know, some, and mother the art all the pain, the music and all kinds of things. Oh, hold up, hold up, hold up. Hold up, hold up, hold up. Let me try again. Let me let him let me out let me let him try to get So but while he comes uh, back, exactly sure, sure, what sure. he was saying about um expressing grief um through the ritual of expressive arts. I mean, we are I, I feel like we come from a, a people who embody the sacred arts and the sound and the drum is the first instrument the mm. you know sound healing is the first healing the the healing sounds of our voices and then the healing sounds of drums whether the drum was very uh primitive and early and the rocks and then to the development of drums made from animal skins etc that we have known um these ways of expressing grief for a very long time. And we're very disconnected from it. And I'm not, you know, romanticizing the return to all of the ancient ways, but simply want to point out that there are probably ways of engaging um, grief healing that we're all doing organically and we're not tying it together to a more ancient lineage and tradition. And there's power in tying it together with And you know what? I just got word this week. I need to reach out to her. I just got word this week that that one of these foundations had the nerve to turn down the 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 grant proposal I submitted to do to do research or to build on the work that that Maimuna Yusuf and her mother and grandmother had been doing for years around sound and healing. Mm. Um Wow. Uh, and they had the nerve to say that just this week that there will there's no room to fund that project. How dare they? And then here you come right, right. 24, 48 hours later to say how valuable that kind of works. One is. of the most primitive healing tools. 
Yeah, I mean that's and that's and fine. and do you, are you, and and then do you, I got a shout out uh 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 my my brother uh Bryce uh Doctor Bryce uh Daryl Bryce for putting me onto the work of Raymond Reif. Do you are you familiar with him? Yeah, Just turn, I'm not. The, 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 a white man in the I think the thirties and forties who had d- d- uh, apparently discovered ways of healing major illnesses using sound frequencies to kill certain uh, mm. cancer cells and other other you know. Uh, and the argument was that, that the medical community removed him because there's no pharmaceutical, you know, riches to be found mm. in developing sound frequencies that don't require <laughs> drugs or anything else that will kill cancer. And other. Now, I don't know. I'm, I don't know whatever happened with all of that, but it was a fascinating uh, documentary and claim. Uh, and that reminds me of, of, you know, when I hear you and, and my Muna and others talk mm-hmm. about these these traditional practices that mm-hmm. sounds like it, that, that Rife was just uh, doing what what often happens where the Western world, the white world will belatedly realize that there's value in what others had been doing for a long time. Very late. Uh, you know what I mean? Like if, if we could just stop enslaving and colonizing them for five minutes, we might actually be able to learn. <laughs> <laughs> well, they were like, but if we, well, no, that, no, how, no. we how are we going to make money? <laughs> I know. So, yeah, there's no money in that. Anyway, but listen, I, I, I um, um, let me, I don't, you know, was there anything else you wanted to, to, to make sure that we heard from in terms of, uh, in terms, ter- heard about in terms of your, your, um, engagement with Hooks and, and, and her work? And I think Brother Kaba is back. Yeah. Uh, but I, you know, uh, and anyway, and and I appreciate you wanting to jump on, you know, yes, and, and, yes, and yes. do this. I, I think that's it. You can find me on Instagram talking all about grief at Baltimore Grief. And um, dig into her trilogy on love. My introduction to Bell Hooks was similar to many's with the very, the political Black feminist writings. Um, I I said, I consider myself a Black feminist and ain't I a woman? And from margin to center, those were my introductions. I think, well, no, I can't say that most profound effect. But the trilogy on love has had a tremendous, tremendous influence on, again, my scholarship, my philosophy for living on many areas of my life. And so I just want to say that. Mm -hmm. I mentioned it before you got here. Did you see and respond to the to, to the comment on your Twitter about uh, uh, Mama Marimba Ani? Uh, uh, um, if, if she didn't agree with hooks, then then there's no value in in something to that effect. Um, somebody oh, had responded to one of your posts. I didn't see yeah, that. Yeah, but that's, somebody, I mean, oh, that's so interesting because I would say, oh, Mama Marimba Ani would be another intellectual giant for me who's had such an influence on my work. <laughs> Um, but I know that, and I don't remember specifically what was said, or if she, I, I can't remember where Ani dealt specifically with hooks. I, I just know that in general, there would be some disagreement, uh, uh, probably profound disagreement, but well, yeah. but I just thought, but my only point was when I mentioned it earlier this morning was that, because uh, um, the comment said, if, if, if Marimba Ani doesn't like, you know, so doesn't like her, then I don't like her. Oh, I don't and, do and my only point was, <laughs> That was my yeah. So I was just like, w- at least no. at least try to find the value in the sister's work, and, yeah. and then, or at least understand what she was doing that Marimba Ani would disagree with, yes. and what Marimba Ani was disagreeing with. I mean, yeah, at least I was gonna say that. also. I mean, yeah. I mean, yeah. I mean, Bell Hooks' catalog of work is so expansive and diverse. I'm gonna need a lot more specificity around that. I mean, because again, the trilogy on love is, I it, I mean is to me is very different from the writings on black feminist intersectionality. Mm. Um, I mean, different in a way that I could see the, the disagreements, but I also, I just, I know I, I'm a eat the meat, leave the bones kind of woman. And so okay. right I on. love Dr. Marimba and his work. And it also, I would say, it's also part of the pantheon of work that had a tremendous influence on my thinking at the same time that bell hooks work was influencing kind of like my foundational thinking and scholarship so i mean i hey, was you look, look you talking to you talking to somebody that had the nerve to create a model that used both ani and karl marx so you know i'm i'm already put <laughs> you know i'm already put the crosshairs on me 
but, know, but, but I'll I find one more. value in all these people's oh, work. Anyway, absolutely. go ahead. Sorry. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So I think I may have said this before, but I consider myself, I mean, I, I'm an inheritor of all intellectual traditions. I said it in the chat on one of your other shows. Like, I'm not cut off from anybody and what they offer. Mm. I don't cut myself off. Um, and I think it's very valuable to note this about Bell Hooks, similar to what you guys started trying to get into with Bobby Wright. I mean, she was a person in transition, ever evolving dynamic. Mm. She had particular thoughts on this and then she changed sometimes you would ask her about something she said before she was like that's what i thought 10 years ago i don't mm -hmm. you know you can't you can't pigeonhole me yeah, like that and say no you said this in mm -hmm. you know in 2001 and this is forever your belief and your embodiment and your philosophy she's like oh i don't believe that anymore and yeah, I, I, that's 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 important. That that right there is important no matter what, because, uh, you know, you started off talking about the winter solstice and, and all of that. And I can remember at one point when I believed in Christmas and, and, and Santa Claus and, or, or even after the Santa Claus piece, just just Christmas. And then I got some information about the, the true reason for the season. When people uh, talk about that, I always laugh. And I think to myself, yeah, you mean the solstice? Right. Now there was a there was a time though probably about twenty years ago you know being a, a a bull in a china shop I just used to just go off and you know <laughs> beat people down and tell them and and force them to hear the real truth about Christmas and Easter and all right. of that Valentine's Day and all of that stuff right. and of course now now when people now I'm a little more you know kind of nuanced I'm a little more sophisticated you know a little little more empathetic you know yes. to, to people and understanding where they where they are. Um, in, in that particular, so still trying to if, get there. If you would have asked me 20 years ago, I would have been a whole different person. And right. I was like, no, I don't. I beat people up anymore over yeah. what they what they celebrate or what they don't celebrate. You know, it's That's like. Right. But I do when people I'm, offer when, when people come out of nowhere and offer the the Merry Christmas to me. I do say Happy Winter Solstice. I, that is my I, response. I, I, like that's I because do, you're the, like, that's because you're the chief petty officer. You don't even count. You, I can't. Uh, yeah, I mean, you, you outside the just, realm. Of, <laughs> Of, of, of reasonability. <laughs> it's, it's just the, the imperial it, arrogance some, that yes, comes right, with that. Right, right. It's the arrogance. It's the, yeah. the arrogance that you're responding to. And like when they say, the God bless you, you. don't, who are you to bless me? No, my bad. Sorry. Go ahead. Go ahead. Sorry. Go ahead. <laughs> right. I don't know your energy. I don't know about your relationship with the divine and the universe. <laughs> you have not been vetted. You got it like that. You could just call on and 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 that'll be the blessing. Nah, man, get out of here. Anyway, I'm just playing. Yeah. I'm just <laughs> but like I said, hopefully, you know, we all uh, follow that model of being able to grow and to think differently, to extend more grace, more love. Um, like I said, more nuance. I struggle with that as well. So. Yeah. Well, we appreciate you coming through here and and uh, as, as always. And now that we got clear on the invitation thing and, you know, you 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 could just pop on whenever this is perfect. So oh, I love that you thing. reached out and I'm glad you could come on um, and, and, and help us with this a little bit. Uh, and we appreciate it. And I've, uh, in the show notes, we put a link to, to your to your work. So people should if they haven't already follow up uh, and uh, we'll catch you next time. Appreciate you. Thank you. you. Happy winter Thank solstice, you. Christmas, Kwanzaa, yes, indeed. All, all festivals of light. Christmas, all festivals. Christmas, Mahana Kwanzaa. All festivals. Christmas, Mahana Kwanzaa. And even for Seinfeld fans, happy Festivus. Festivus. You know what I'm yeah, saying? Yeah. Everybody, yes, everybody yes. can get. Yes, 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 yes. Thank you, Jared. It was good. Yeah, anytime. You. Anytime. All right. Take, take care, care, sis. Peace. Bye. All right, good people. Uh, let's take a quick break and then we will come right back. And uh, uh, as we await Asheru, we got a couple other things we can get in and uh, uh, continue the conversation right here at I Mix What I Like. So don't go anywhere. We're back in just a second. Please. I mix what I like, what I like, what I like, what I like, what I like. All right, Brother Kabaz, we push forward here. Definitely big shout out to, to Dr. Niyasha. Uh, and uh, uh, yeah, she said 15 minutes. We knew it was going to be more than 15 minutes. We needed to, it, it needed to be more than 15 minutes. You know what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. uh, uh, you know, so, but we appreciate that. That was, that was great. Um, yeah. So I know my man Asheru is is uh, likely on his way, um, but there was a couple other things that I know I was hoping uh, to get to, so we can we could take some time and get to some of that uh, as we await 
our, our guest. Um, you've, I was trying to remember how much work have you done with Asheru artistically? Like, ha- have you, you haven't performed nah. at all with him ever? No, nah, ever, never. Mm-hmm. That's weird. Okay. No. Nah. I would have, I would have, if I was, if I was doing like a, a, um, you know, trying to do whatever these DJs do, these, these, I, that's, I would have tried to cr- arrange that collabo for, for a mixtape yeah. for sure. That should have been, did, I just We assumed. did have a, I, now we've never really formally met, but we did kind of meet in passing and I, I'll wait till he's on week to talk about that. Cause I, I think I mentioned okay. it before, uh, briefly kind of, I kind of referenced it before here on the, on the program, but we'll get more into it. It's pretty interesting. All right. Well, yeah. All right. Well, that's hey, that's a nice tease right there. So we'll we'll, yeah. we'll wait for that. Um, but by the way, uh, one of the things that I know Asheru has done when he came through uh, Morgan State a couple years ago uh, with with Hip Hop Pantsula, the the brother from uh, South Africa, uh, um, uh, they came through Morgan, and I want to use that as a ref to make a reference to to not only my my institution. But the HBCU project, I'm inviting people to participate in. If you've been a student, staff, administrator, parent of uh, whatever, and had any engagement experience with HBCUs, please go to imixwhatilike.org and um, jump on the the. Well, it's up to you how short or long it is, but the the the, the questionnaire that's there, I'd I'd love to hear from you um, as that project continues going on. So it's the Not A Different World Project uh, at imixwhatilike.org. Please encourage and, and do that yourselves. Um, let me let me see something here. Uh, let's see. Let's see. Okay. All right. Nope. That's not him. All right. So let me let me just see if uh, um, while we wait for him, let's, let's do a couple things here because there's one thing that um, I know we like to pay a lot of attention to here at uh, Black Power Media and certainly at this program as well. Uh, the the continued plight and struggle around political prisoners. Um, and there was a piece written recently about uh, the ongoing struggle with Russell Maroon Schultz, who we covered was recently just released. And what I'm going to have to do, it looks like, Let me. All right, that's not it. Me, well, while you're looking people, for it, uh, it's, it, interestingly enough, yeah. la- yesterday, just last night, uh, you know, because I don't really watch a whole lot of TV, but I, I did catch. Uh, I usually watch YouTube if I watch some certain things, and I was looking and I saw that there was an alert of uh, this. All these different left, uh, so-called left, uh, white liberal, so-called liberal media spaces, and they had this this program on Julia Assange. <laughs> And I was like, and so I just dipped in for a second, checked it out. It's like, oh, that's interesting, you know. And I thought about what what you had said the other day on uh, on the Remix Morning Show. I think it was you talking about talking about that and how their their, their woeful lack of coverage around black political. Oh, I think it was somebody that you engaged and asked them about it, um, and they would have some kind of conversations around it. But I just thought it was interesting because they they would they would go on all. It was like a it's like a what an Avengers assembly of the white. You know, that's liberal. right. <laughs> You're talking about they had, and they did one for for the Stephen. I think Stephen Donziger case around uh, Chevron, his case that he just got released. Right. Uh, uh, so they got him out, uh, and I, you know, so and I and I saw the same thing, and I even popped on to to one of Katie Halper's joints. Yeah, that's, um, that's what it was. Yeah, yeah, and I was saying I I paid four ninety nine to make the point that you know, like I just couldn't help it. I was like, it was it was you know. But uh, um, the petty in you, uh, the petty in you couldn't help it. Go ahead. The petty in me, yeah. I ain't, I ain't, mad. ain't nobody mad at that one. So, so Josh, do me a favor and scroll down on that a little bit. Uh, uh, just uh, we'll get to this and just thank you very much. You can just leave it right there, um, uh, so folks can see the title and I and I'll put the link in the show notes if it's not already there to this story by Charlotte Rosen uh, um, on Russell Maroon Schultz's death by regulation. Um, And just a couple points uh, from here, Uh, quoting him, uh, she writes, I am not under a court sentence of death. I have, however, been sentenced to death by regulation. And these, of course, were were the words written by Russell Maroon Schultz in 1997 while in solitary confinement, but of course have uh, unfortunately 
uh, largely rung true going forward. And even though, as, as the story says here, quote, after a long campaign for his release, Schultz was recently granted compassionate release on October 25th, uh, 2021, and is now able to enter hospice care surrounded by family and close friends. He is 78 years old and suffering from the life-threatening health conditions, most pressingly stage four cancer. The life and writings of Russell Maroon Schultz are not widely known. As Quincy Saul wrote in an introduction to Schultz's collection, uh, collected writings, this is no accident. The suppression of Maroon's ideas, Maroon histories and programs for Maroon futures is to be expected under a racial capitalist regime hell bent on criminalizing political dissent and forms of truth telling that challenge the carceral status quo. But Schultz's analysis analyses of the U.S. prison industrial complex, recollect, recollections and reassessments of the post-1960s era of Black liberation movement and insights on movement tactics and strategy deserve the close attention of carceral state historians serious about listening to when the pen is with the Maroons, end quote. Um, I will continue to, to encourage people to read not only uh, everything about Schultz, but uh, uh, the Maroon Implacable book, uh, his collection of writings, uh, his analysis is is still relevant and maybe more relevant than most. And it's just another reminder that even though he was let out just in time to go into hospice, uh, so many things. There are other political prisoners, of course, Sundiata Akoli, Leonard Peltier, Mumia Abu-Jamal, Mutulu Shakur, uh, Jamil Alamine, among them, uh, 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 Jawanza Bowers. I mean, there's so many others that that still need to be freed and don't get enough attention. But but uh, um, for my, my, me personally, I just as much as we want them out, I don't want them. I don't want the state to be given any credit for letting them out just in time to go into hospice. Um, uh, I, so I don't. You know, it's an improvement, but but I, I, I caution us against uh, considering this a, a victory. Uh, and to the extent that we point out the failings of white left potential allies or whatever, uh, it's just a reminder of, again of how much we have to do uh, uh, in our own work and in our own communities to 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 raise up these these uh, struggles and to enhance them. So uh, anyway, just wanted to to continue to to you know follow that and make note of this. Uh, support the abolitionist law center and their work as well. Um, uh, and to try to get the rest of these folks out um, and and to prevent others from going in as political prisoners. So uh, anyway, that was that was really all that I had for that. Uh, just wanted to to anyway, acknowledge that that recent story and encourage that we continue to follow up and support those efforts um, around political prisoners. So. I do see Asheru is is in the in the in the backstage studio. So if if we can, we'll take another quick break here and come back and get into this discussion with the mighty mighty Asheru. So don't go anywhere. Still much more here. I mix what I like in Black Power. I mix what I like. 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 All right. So as many people may be familiar and unfortunately, I, uh, um, not enough are familiar maybe with his broader catalog of work. And I know he's got some new work he wanted to, to bring to our attention as well. But we know we have the the uh, uh, creator and uh, author of the Boondocks theme song, which I think is one of the best, if not the best television theme song ever. And I, used, and I have a lot to pick from. You know what I mean, it's like the Barney Miller joint was hot. The Sanford and Son joint was hot. Good Times, of course, was hot. Uh, uh, What's Happening theme song was hot. Uh, the Jeffersons theme song was hot. But I think this Boondocks joint is is is, is tops them all. Uh, um, had the pleasure of seeing him perform it live, rocking with the Elves. All it has a, an incredible catalog of music actually uh, coming out of, out of D.C. But really. Uh, a global artist and activist and educator. And I'm talking about the Gabriel Asheru. Ben, welcome, good brother. It's good All to right. see you again and good morning. Good morning, good morning. Good morning. How you doing? Good morning. Doing great. Doing, it's brother? good to see you again, my man. Good to been see you too, long, man. man. It's been a minute. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, um, now, when we were waiting for you to, to jump on, uh, I had been just under the assumption that you and Brother Kaba had 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 worked together, had had done some performance together. 
I wanted to even say that I had at some point uh, uh, arranged for you two to perform together, but apparently that is not the case. And there is something that in Kaba, you said you had a story you wanted to wait till he was here uh, <laughs> yeah. uh, to to bring up. Uh, yeah, yeah, we, yeah. So we, go ahead. Yeah, we well, we never really formally met, but we did kind of sort of meet. Uh, I guess probably about five years ago or so, uh, I was driving uh, for one of these ride hailing services, and I picked up a brother. <laughs> I picked up this brother and I said, man, that name looks familiar, you know, <laughs> and I, and he was going to Petworth. So I took him over to drove him over to Petworth uh, from uh, Northeast D.C. And uh, and uh, it was you, brother. We had I had a little short conversation. I told you I enjoyed your music oh, or whatever. I, I, don't, I don't know if you remember that, but that was just I was like, yeah, oh, so wow. We, we, so we did kind of sort of meet. But so so even though you were hating and didn't and didn't make the introduction, Dr. Ball, <laughs> you know, I had to. We had to let the white man do it <laughs> right here on service. Right. <laughs> My bad. I just assumed that it happened. I mean, uh, yeah. Uh, um, yeah. Anyway, so uh, that, yeah, that's on. Uh, that's crazy. That that the, there needs to be a collaboration from from two of the best in the area. Uh, two of my favorite artists for sure. But but anyway, man, Ashru, man, what, what's been going on, man? I you know. Uh, um, uh, I, I, I praise your work all the time, I, but apparently I've not been caught up with the latest. You know, just last or two weeks ago, we had um, Tony Blackman on. We had the founders on. For, uh, uh, I mean, the, the founders, the creators of a, of a, of a new DC hip hop history uh, documentary. Uh, yeah, that yeah, that yeah. you know, so so it, it's you know, I, I I would love to hear what you think about all of that. I mean, you know, talk about some of that 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 history. But let's start with the newness. The, the freshest stuff first and work back. Like what's, what's the latest that you got that's out here uh, that, that we need to know about what's, what's going on, man. Uh, <laughs> a lot Cause I know you got the music, you got the guerrilla arts, there's, there's the educational. So, so, you know, there's a lot of new to catch up with. So, wherever you so um, I mean, man, I haven't, I haven't been as active in the music as I'd like to be, but um, I still, you know, I still pull my sword out every now and then. Mm -hmm. And so um, the latest, I put out uh, Two Tone, DJ Two Tone Jones put out a project called uh, Contraband from India. And it features a song with me, Joe D, Prince Poe from Organized Confusion, produced by Diamond D, which is like super dope. And you know, it, the wow. other side of that though is that we all, Diamond D, myself, Two Tone, um, we all went through the State Department uh, Global Hip Hop Ambassadorship together. And so it was kind of also like us doing a group project in that lens. And uh, so he sampled a lot of music from India, which is the country that Two Tone went to. I forget where Diamond D went. And I went to Bangladesh. Um, but that was also part of that collaboration. Um, and then Tell I Two Tone, I said, "What's up, man?" He, he, he. I think, I think the brother's too big for me, man. I, I like, like he used to. For folks that don't know, when we, you know, he was, he was our DJ uh, with the Black Academics when we the started with the, yeah, that's right. with the Cipher. Yeah. Uh, uh, and, and you know, uh, we could see the 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 future even then, but you know, now he's he's too big time. Now he, he got the gray hair and everything. Yeah, you know, yeah, he's got know. the sophisticated look. You know, you I know, I texted you, him, he don't respond. You know, so tell him I said what's up, man. You know how it gets when brothers get distinguished, man. You know, they just yeah. Like, Start to, yeah, know. I'm not mad. I think you know, and honestly, I mean, I think he's an amazing DJ, and yeah. I think his his ear is 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 mm -hmm. fantastic. So I'm glad mm -hmm. to see it. You know, a great brother. Uh, uh, um, yeah. uh, I just you know like to make fun of cats when they get too big to respond to my text. Exactly. Messages. Nah, nah. You, you know, but it's all them, good, man. man. Yeah, stay on. Man. <laughs> <laughs> so look, man. But why you bring that? So, so I asked uh, uh, Tony about this, um, and I and I told her that that you know uh, some years ago uh, when I raised this question, and I had to admit that I brought it to some cats, um, uh, and I and I, I didn't share it with her, but I just say I and, and shout out to them, man. I had interviewed um, uh, Opus Saka Ben years ago uh, about this issue. Some some cats legendary to to, to DC and beyond in terms of hip hop, and. Um, and I, I have to be honest, man. I don't think my energy was appropriate, man. And I think I came with it with an, 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 an unfair energy in my question about artists who, who do that State Department ambassadorship. Mm -hmm. uh, and I was trying to raise, you know, just 
I think in my heart, I was trying to just ask an, an honest question like, well, when the State Department acknowledges, as did Hillary Clinton when she was running it, that we're going to use hip hop the way we use jazz to promote, uh, uh, you know, really a fantasy of America. Uh, and I was just trying to find out, like, how how do artists who take that trip feel about that? You know, so so as an outside critic, I'm saying, you know, um, uh, artists, these great artists. I mean, you, you know, uh, I, I know Head Rock was approached at once. You you did, the, you know, all, you know, the like Tony's out there. Tony, like Tony was um, the first. Tony Blackman was. Yeah, the first. Tony was the first. Yeah. So I'm saying, like, how how if, if 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 an outside critic is saying, why are they working for the State Department? Um, you know, what, what, what are we missing and what from your perspective is, is happening that we don't get to see? Uh, um, and then also I have to be fair, like nobody has said, Jared, we want to send you around the world to right. share your ideas and your work. Right. Like, what would I do? You know, I don't get invited. So it's easy for me to sit there and say it's, 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 it's politically, um, you know, uh, harmful maybe but but i don't really know man so so tell me what man you know when we when we all right so when we got the call that we were going to do it right we all meet well they are people from all over the country were coming to dc all over the world we're coming to dc to have the meeting at the state department so we all go in there and we're sitting at the table and you know cats like cats like us that's been up late nights reading conspiracies and all of that. <laughs> we sitting in the room like, all right, so what's up? And they're like going through the whole formal, oh, welcome, this is the State Department, it's illustrious, da, 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 da. And so I asked, I mean, I was one of the people who asked in the room, I wasn't the only one, but I asked like, do y'all expect us to go to these places like waving the American flag? <laughs> and they were like, no, just be you. Just do your thing. You don't have to talk any politics at all to anyone. I was like, okay. They were like, matter of fact, it'd be better if you didn't talk mm. any politics to anyone, right? And I think you, it, for obvious reasons. So we just, you know, for a lot of us, I speak for me. I mean, I went into it kind of like that at first, but then I was just like, you know what? This is a crazy opportunity. I'm going to go to Bangladesh for a month to just rhyme and teach youngins how to rhyme. I'll do it. I, and, and to me, I had to get over the State Department being the funder of it because, I mean, I've done deals with my brothers and got jerked. Mm. <laughs> you know what mm -hmm. I'm saying? So State Department, and it wasn't like they was paying a big bag. It was just, it was a modest bag, but it was the opportunity and the resume right. of you being do, an ambassador. Do the, people, do the people who bring you into those meetings, do they legit know your work? Are they like going through like a list of artists? Like, do they really know who you are? Like, are they like fans? And that's why, or or are they just I don't like know. I don't, I don't hear some so. names? I mean, no, let me not say that. I think so. I think somebody in the workings may know me, but the first, you know, when I first hear about it, now nah, it's just people saying, "Yo, you should you be great for this. You teach. You're a hip hop artist. You should try to do it." You know what I mean? And that was how I got approached. And then um, I just do an, I just put my application in and got it. You know what I mean, but and then do the people in 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 like do the people in Bangladesh or wherever people go are they like oh, what oh, was yeah. that reception like? Yes, yeah. Well, you know they, they know who you were, yeah, so they're not are. mad that they're not like getting like a a, a, a like a, a like a, a, a like a quote unquote superstar celebrity. Right, they're, right, they're, right. they're not like mad like no, why no. why isn't Jay Z or you know not at okay, all. Yeah. And you know it's funny. That's what's up. That's um that's kind of how it's been any country I've gone to outside of the State mm. Department thing. When mm. you get there. To these other countries, Norway, Denmark, Sweden, Switzerland, you know, like Eastern European countries, Germany, when you hopping around like that, they love the fact that you are a, a, an authentic African American hip hop article. Mm, so to mm. them, you are a superstar. Just the fact that you are black American, mm. it makes hip hop. You, you ain't gotta be Jay Z. You just got to be a real hip hop, authentic kind of thing. And yeah, man, a lot of places I've gone like early in the early like time when we were touring, I was shocked that people would know our music, man, to be honest. Mm. We were getting in countries, people were singing our stuff back. And I'm like, mm. yeah. but then when we got to Bangladesh, when I got to Bangladesh, they hadn't heard none of my earliest stuff. All they knew was the boondocks. 
Mm-hmm. They were like, oh, the Boondocks dude is here. <laughs> <laughs> so it was that kind of reaction. Um, but then, And the we- joint is a surefire single, though. Like, that's yeah, what I'm yeah. saying. Like, yeah, And yeah. when you do the extended verses on the joint and you were yeah. doing the remix version, all that stuff, that's, that yeah. joint is fire, <laughs> man. I mean, I, 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 I mean, anyway, so like it's, it is a standalone hit. Like, I've even played it. Uh, 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 if I had it one semester and, and one of my students had never seen the boondocks as a show. Oh, wow. And I just played the intro thinking this is how I'm, and I'm trying, honestly, I'm trying to score points in the classroom. Like I actually can talk to him. I know this dude a little bit, right, like, right, like, right. like, like, you know, like, like try to, you know, get the cool professor points or whatever. But, but the dude was like, that, that joint is hot. And I was like, but that's the theme song for the, he was like, I didn't, I don't, I, I, was, I didn't even know it was, had anything to do with the show. And I'm like, yeah, yeah all right, well, that's, yeah. that's proof. And anyway, so who, 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 produ- who produced that track? Uh, who, who, who uh, did the track? His name is Derek Thornton. He's the, he was the music producer for the show. He works on stuff like Power and all of that now. Mm. Yeah. But Derek, that was, that was was, and then all the scratches were, um, was, um, uh, was Omar, Omar Retinue from, oh, wow. On the remains. So he did all the scratches and you know, we did like seven, that's the seventh version of that song. So I got other versions with blue black on them. I got mm-hmm. like, man, we made all these versions that Aaron was like, nah, nah, nah. And I was like, yo, these joints are fire, bro. What is wrong with you? You know what I mean? But that's the Do one. Do you realize that one of the last nights I went out that I left the house was years ago to see your reunion with Blue Black at 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 at, 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 at the I don't even remember the what's the name of the spot. Bars, I think. At Bloom at Boom Bars, yeah, that's yeah, right. Yeah, damn. You have Munir out there with the guitar and all that. I was right, like, I gotta right. be at that joint. That yeah. was that was a big reunion type yeah, thing man. for me. So I was like, man, and 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 I've been out the house like three times since. <laughs> <laughs> And this year is our 20th anniversary of Soon Come, my first album. Oh, wow. Elevator, Elevator Music was my jam. Elevator Music, Elevator yeah. Music was my jam. Yeah. There's a lot of joints. That's a yeah. great oh, album, yeah. man. Yeah, yeah, uh, yeah, yeah, uh, yeah. It's a classic, man. man so people congratulations still on that, email man. me about that album. They still yeah. email me, hit me on the DMs. Like, man, you don't understand, bro. Like, people have whole testimonies off that album. Man. I love reading them, too, because I'm like, you know, I think Look, about man, the mind state we were in when we made that stuff. You know what I mean? As an early my man Ty, Ty Burroughs, his line is that that album reminds me of the music that came out at a time where we thought we were going to win. That's how his phrase was when we thought we were going to win. And that that is a perfect, perfect. album. Who's perfect. You put that on, you feel like, oh yeah, we about to win. Yeah, <laughs> that's right. That's right. We about to, you, about, you know what? I'm about to play it today, man, because we about to win. Bro. Yeah. Win. Yeah. Cool. Yeah, let's bring it back. I'm gonna play it yeah. too, man. I'm a, yeah, that that joint is. And shout out to Blue Black too, man. That's shout a good dude. Blue Black. Man. Yeah, man. He's down in. He's living in Florida now, but he's doing well, man. Mm. He's still. You know, it's funny. His original partner. So Blue Black used to be in a group called Blue Black and Brown. They were the first oh. unspoken heard, first iteration of it. And Gingy Brown was his partner. Um, Gingy Brown mm-hmm. is like. He came up under Pete Rock, like he made all this stuff back in the stuff you've heard. Just he's like a he's like an old school producer, but he's still a DJ producer. He's running around the world now, still doing that. But they both live in Florida now, so Blue, Black, and Brown kind of kind of reconnected down there, which is dope. Now that's what's up. No, that's really that's really good. And are they putting music together? Are they so they're doing? I don't know. Music? I'm sure they're just doing something else. Happen, okay. You know, we always talk about man. I think I'm I'm gonna hang it up. I mean, you can't ever hang it up. Why? Exactly. You do why. think about that. You do I think have. about that sometimes. Yeah, I have. I have. Why? Yeah. Like, what you didn't? Is it a career thing? Like, or 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 what? What is it? Career thing. It's just sometimes life get in the way. You can't be on that schedule to record and and be in that zone mm. like you like to. Like I like to. But you know what I had to realize is that's just all. That's just all bullshit fear talking. Ain't nobody going nowhere, man. We gonna keep okay, making good. music. We gonna keep writing songs. It's just not, it might not be put out every year on an album format or whatever, but the production of it is still gonna still get made, so. So are you still are you still making me, guest appearances on, on oh albums yeah. and things? Oh yeah, okay. yeah, yeah. Oh yeah, uh, I pop up on yeah. everything. Okay, because I'm, I'm, work, I'm, work, I'm working on something right now, so I'm I'll just saying, me, yeah, we, need, we, need, we need to connect. Cause I, I think I, I think we live close to each other in it too, so that could also okay. help. So okay, so yeah. my work is complete. Yeah, yeah. yeah I now I can retire. I mean, uh, if so, y'all substantial, me and substantial put something out last year, 
I mean, yeah, I still hop in. Like I said, I pull the sword out regularly, but mm -hmm. um, sitting down and writing another album and all of that, that's something that I got to really dedicate time to right now. And that's, you know, it's going to take a minute. But I'm in a new studio space now in Brooklyn. Uh, we just opened up our studios to the public. It's a uh, recording slash co-working space um, in Brooklyn in the Arts Walk. So oh, okay. oh, really? Events. Yeah, wow. we do pop-up events. We do, um, we doing different things that we got coming up, like spades on Sundays and, you know, um, just, just doing spades. Stuff. Yeah, spades, spades, come through. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Like, we're like, slam the, like, I might have to table. dust that off. We're doing slam a space table. podcast, so you two should come together and we'll, we'll beat y'all down while we interview. No, Slim. That's not gonna you, happen. Now you're talking crazy. Nah, no, I'm, that's not gonna happen. I invite oh, no, no. no. Me and Big Rock versus y'all two brothers. We'll sit at the table. Listen, listen. Turn the camera on. We'll talk about everything y'all got going on. Brother Kabao, we understand. gotta take it back. We gotta take it back to the Navy to the days, bro. That's what I'm saying. That's military, what I'm saying. Listen, They're not ready. Listen. Hey, Let's bro, do it. We, we never even played. We never even partnered together. We used to. We slam, never even partnered together. Y'all, y'all all heard it. We used to first. slam. We used to Let's slam the cards happen. down on the table and break tables. Ma! We used to. We used to destroy tables, slamming them big jokers down. You don't understand. Oh no, I understand. Y'all, y'all, y'all ain't played nobody like us. <laughs> but I actually <laughs> just, I actually I just hurt my it. my shoulder. Love I just re-injured my shoulder. Uh, I gotta be careful. That yeah, actually hurt. Like you, That's like what I'm saying. Can't I can't slap the table. No, no, no. I'm over here talking all this insane. shit. It hurt myself. <laughs> Let's go. But it's on. Oh, oh, that's that's beautiful. Uh oh, I love you know, it. And you know, as long as um, you you know gadget, right? Uh filmmaker, tech tech guy. I thought y'all knew each other. He's on, um, but he's, he's maybe. He's the guy that I've been collaborating with to put it together. He's like, Gabe, all you got to do is get a table and four chairs. And I'll set everything up. I was like, oh, okay, done deal. So y'all be our first guest. For real, come on. We, and our first I, guest. I'm, as soon as we wrap up this morning, I'm going to start texting and setting okay. the schedule together. Okay, so so it's, it's, it is going to happen. Let's go. And I just... I just want us to stay friends afterwards, though. I don't I, I, like. I don't want. I don't want any hurt feelings, no, and no, I don't want us good. to be okay. All right, all right okay. Because to come up, because to come up in your own spot and beat you down in a game of spades in front of everybody on camera. Our first podcast. It's kind of. It's kind of. It's kind of disrespectful. Imagine that. Disrespectful. That would be. Yeah. Yeah. But we don't mind want, being okay. disrespectful. Y'all don't want to cut the cameras off, but we gonna keep them running. I'm just letting y'all know that now. Oh no 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 no. No, 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 no. They can't might, come off. They, they can't, can't turn, turn off. off. No, no. Y'all might end up running. <laughs> might end up running. That might that might be what happened. No, they're gonna get run. That's what's gonna no, happen. They're gonna, they're gonna, get, gonna run. get run. Exactly. That's exactly. what's gonna happen. You're gonna run to Boston. Oh, I love it. This is. The... Are we gonna run between D.C. and Baltimore? Keep record. Keep this clip. <laughs> keep this clip. <laughs> Where we turn it. Cause y'all ain't y'all ain't never met no space players like us, so just oh just oh just oh that. man, feelings over here, man okay. man. Look, I, I don't get me on my imperialist thing. I'm like Cecil Rhodes when it comes to spades. I would oh, I would no. tell from the Cape to Cairo. You know what I'm saying? From the Cape to Cairo, I top it with the tail. Is it? So that's beautiful. Okay, I love yeah, it. I love yeah. it. Let's go. Um, all right, listen. Before, so I don't want to. I don't want to spend the rest of the morning talking shit about space. Yeah, because yeah, yeah. we could. That don't happen. Because we, we could. We could. It, right, right, right. After we win, <laughs> when we come back, we'll come back. Yeah, that's when we'll do that. Yeah. How the reaction? Um, <laughs> but the the, the 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 reality is, all all jokes aside, you you are easily one of my favorite MCs. I get in trouble on occasion because I will actually enter your name in top 10 lists when we have those debates. Uh, and a lot of times, unfortunately, the reality is people just don't, a lot of people just don't know. It, it, they don't, they don't, because they don't know the catalog. They don't know the the history. You've done, you've worked with not only people you've named, you've worked with Talib Kweli. You've worked, I mean, I can't remember all the names. You've, you've, you've been all over the world. You've got a, a whole uh, a, a catalog. Um, uh, so I did. I just wanted to ask, in general, just a little bit about that. What has that career been like? I mean, you know, in 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 terms of uh, even coming out of the D.C. area, which is not, mm -hmm. 
you know, often known to, you know, or, or people don't often look to this area to, to find all the superstars and whatnot. And there've been plenty of people to be quote unquote more famous that have nowhere near the skill. Uh, so I'm just wondering like any, anything you would want to say about what it's been like to come out of this area, to have had the career that you're still having, to been all over the world. I mean, what, what is that? I, I, any, I, I'm just it's, curious, uh, what, what is that like? It's surreal sometimes, man, to be honest. It's really like, um, it's, it's strange. Cause I mean, I think I could have definitely done better to market and promote what I was doing and all that, but I was so busy doing it. I didn't market and promote it. You know what I mean? And I didn't really have teams or machine behind us. We just would go and just off of pure passion and energy, you know? And so I think if we had other systems in place, it probably would have been a springboard mm. and done some other stuff. But to be honest, man, I feel like the Forrest Gump of this rap shit, man. I have been mm. all over the world. I've been in all these situations, been in places nobody will believe. You know what I'm saying? Mm. And I just, but it's like a tree falling in the forest. <laughs> you know what I mean? So it's like people don't know, but I've had some amazing, like life-changing experiences through hip hop, through my career, through making music and traveling. Um, 25 some countries. You know what I mean? Doing like, I mean, working with some amazing artists and building new fans. Let me ask that. Who are your favorite artists to work with? Who who have you crossed paths with that, that you've really enjoyed that experience? I mean, uh, that's um, a piece job, but he was one of my favorites to work mm, with because it was mm. so like automatic. He walk in and it's like, let's make a song and song is made. You know what I mean? Mm. Um, other people... Um, I mean, um, substantial, substantial. I like working with him too. Um, you know, me, Wayne, and Roddy. We put, we did a lot of work together. We got a whole mm -hmm. album in the tuck. It's just sitting there, not coming out. Mm -hmm. Ask Roddy. Don't yell at me. Um, like you know, so Blue Black. He's one of my favorite. I mean, always easy to work with. Um, Raheem Devon, to be honest. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Anything I've ever said, mm -hmm. Raheem. Sends the shit back in a day, quick. Mm -hmm. Like I'm impressed by quick, quick workers. I don't work quick. I work. I take my time. So when I'm working with folks and they like, bah, 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 they just firing on all cylinders. It just makes it so much easier mm -hmm. to just. Man, my only Raheem Devon story, I got to say this, shout out to him. I went to to see a show where D'Angelo was set to perform because he's still on my bucket list of people that I haven't seen perform live what? that I really want to see. Okay. Yeah, I haven't. I, I, I went to the show. I went. I tried. I want to go see Dang. him perform live. Him and they said, and they said, and and they said Dr. Ball is here, so don't, so. Don't no, uh, yeah, they, they, they were like, yeah, you don't want to be got a real him, Rakim got a real is hate. another one on my on my bucket list, mm. but 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 I've heard wow. some, I've actually heard some some negative things about Rakim's live performance, unfortunately. Okay. So I don't know. Black but D'Angelo, I wanted black. to see. But he got sick. D'Angelo, they said it was a last minute scratch, and they and they said, but we got Raheem Devon, who came up uh uh, you know, because he's right down the road. So they were like, they brought and he killed it. And I was, and I remember telling my wife, I was saying, I was saying that that's truly impressive because he was, he wasn't set. He wasn't scheduled, uh, uh, you know, whatever oh, rehearsal good. time was, yeah. he stepped up there and blew the place off. The, I was like, damn, mm -hmm. that was really impressive. I got it. So this, I, this, I, this you know, I, this is what I mean by four yeah. dumb moments, because I remember in 99 sitting in the parking lot across the street from uh, Cafe Nima. This before it was mm -hmm. the Ellington. It was wow. a parking lot. Oh, wow. I, I remember. And I remember sitting wow. in the parking lot with Raheem, and I'm playing him the mood swing beat. And I'm like, I was going to ask you about that. I was going to ask you about that. We're sitting in the car. we sitting in the car burning. Yeah. And I'm like, Who did that beat? Huh? Who did that beat? Joe Money. Yusef <laughs> De Niro. My man, that Joe Money. Hot. He did. He did soul. He did, um, he did a bunch of stuff. Truly unique. Like, brother's bad. Uh, oh wow! He it, oh oh yeah, those are good tracks. Yeah, that he, mood swing joint. Yeah, man, that John Coltrane joint. joint. Oh my god! And so yeah. look, I'm sitting in the car with Raheem. Like yo, I'm going up. I'm sending this to Kwali tomorrow. I just need you to like you know give me something. Blah, 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 blah. And he's sitting in the car like I hear him. I you know you know when you hear them stories about Jay Z how he just be like mm. right like, right. <laughs> 
That's what Raheem was doing. He was sitting in the car going. <laughs> and then, man, I promise you, a day or two later, that thing was done. And, and if I folks have not heard this, phone. get it now. Go yeah. wherever you got to go. Mood Swing, Asheru, mm -hmm. uh, uh, Raheem Devon, Talib Kweli. That, yeah. is, that is one of the baddest, baddest man. tracks ever. Man. Uh, oh, yeah. Thank you, man. Everything about it and, is and, perfect. And I used to get in trouble when, when, because because the PFW for 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 you know when I was doing the jazz, you know, uh, uh, it was supposed to be a jazz show. Oh right, right, right. You and I would rock right. that joint. I remember Ron Pitchback called me one morning. The former GM called me one morning. I was on the air early in the morning. I played that. And it, la 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 la. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> La la la, and I was like, it, it was, what is this? That is supposed to be a cold train. It's a that's not this is jazz, not hip hop. Oh. It is supposed to be. I was like, my man, you're not listening. Are you hearing this joint? Yeah, anyway, no, this joint was man, crazy. Was uh, anyway, yeah. yeah, 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 very well done. Um, yeah, I'm definitely, yeah, I, still, I definitely, I still, wanted to I still bang that. that. I still bang that. Like, oh, that's, yeah, that's that, that that stands up. That's like, that's what you call a classic. It Thank stands you, up right now. Like, how, how long was Absolutely. that? Absolutely. Like, 20 years ago? How long was that? 14, was that? about 14, 14 15 yeah. years ago. Okay, yeah, man. That's, yeah, that joint is hot. I appreciate man. it, man. And even yeah. like, you know, even songs like um, Jamboree, you know, like, people don't know, 88 mm -hmm. Kings did that beat. Mm. You know oh, wow. Man? Like, wow. I was working with, I, I remember being at New York and with Most and Quali back in the day when Cosmology came out, before the first wow. time. Oh wow! Rockets, this is when they were first on Rockets. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. And we were on Seven Heads. So we were always running in the same circles because Seven Heads used to do Street Team for Rockets, which is how we were yeah. always in the same. Oh wow! You know, okay, Bam Sadiq, like like a Piney, like all of them folks you remember from way back then. Pumpkinhead. I remember. I remember oh, being wow. in Amsterdam with Pumpkinhead, riding around doing workshops with mm -hmm. kids and stuff. Like people, oh wow! So it's like so many of these experiences, man, just help build the build all of what I what I do. You know what I mean? And it's why I've always stayed in the lane that I've been in because I've had friends, like close friends, be like, "Man, you will blow up if you didn't rap about that shit you rap about." You know what I mean? And I'll be like, "Man, come on, man! What what you want me to rap about? This stuff that I don't know nothing about, or you want me to?" Be authentically me, you know what I mean, and and I've just. But see, I always thought, see, I, so I've I've in my mind, I have you in that lane of artists that shouldn't have that particular problem. Like I don't, it, it's not that you rhyme about nonsense, but your politics, it's not, it's not this like the overt of a dead prez or a public enemy right, right, or right, whoever right. else. And, and so I've reference. always thought. Mm -hmm. But that's what I'm saying. Like I've always thought mm -hmm. it's, that this you people like you people like Mamuna Youssef people like right. like uh, um, mm -hmm. Odyssey to a certain extent that, that I know who've come out of this area who 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 have blown to a certain extent but should be so there you all are the proof of the the fakeness and the whackness of the industry because mm -hmm. there's no denying the talent and the skill and nobody is out here. You, it, there's no. Again, it's not the overt rhyming or the overt projection of politics that 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 would, you know, terrify people. Uh, no, but you uh, know what it is, it's man. Just, it, 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 it just takes time just, for yeah. people to catch up. It's like we're in a we're in a space now where it's it's kind of um, I won't say trendy, but it's kind of more the norm for people to be a little more conscious and to be a little more discerning of what they look. Maybe in the circles I'm seeing, but People are a little more discerning now. They're not, before it was just blind leading the blind. And I think mm -hmm. we were trying to make the music we were making in that kind of climate. And I think now people are catching up. Like people are just hearing Sleepless in Soweto. That was seven years oh, ago. Wow. But they're just now going, oh, I get what he was doing with the, 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 you know what I mean? So I just think that over time, if you keep at it over time, the, the people will catch up to you. But it's like you can't try to gauge or cater to what you think the market is because it's unpredictable. And half of them, like half the stuff they listen to, I would never listen to. You know what I mean? The stuff that they think is dope won't even get no play in my house. So it's like knowing that you got to just make it and the people will find you, man. And I think that's what's happening. Like Odyssey, he's, he's found... His niche has found him. 
Mm-hmm. You know what I mean? <laughs> Versus him putting it out there and trying to find everybody. His people found him. Like if you if you like un- independent music, if you like his type of music, if you like his rhyme style, you like the fact that he's um, Sudanese. If you Muslim, he got all those little niches of people that right, are like, right. You know what I mean? So it's the same thing. I have my niche of people who are like, you know, he's an educator. He does this. He does. I support that. Bro. I love that brother. And they'll support it, you know. So it's just you got to just keep making it for the ones that support you and love you and not worry about. Whatever. But, but part of my point is that when I played when because I've, I've even it's, to a certain extent, it's been like a, a sociological uh, 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 test in my own household. From from the time my children have been born, I play them all your music, and they listen. They're kids. They're, they're young people. They're teenagers now. They hear everything that's out there. They know what's right. hot. But right. when they hear your music, when they hear, I played. Um, uh, um, uh, Odyssey was we when that album came out, we rocked it a lot with the kids, and we just played it. Uh, one of um, uh, um, Ready to Rock, Ready to Roll, that track he did. Yeah, like, yeah. we just played it again the other day. My kids were loving it. It's like, mm-hmm. again, they were like, oh, daddy, I remember you playing that before. They're yeah, like, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm like, so my point is, people, if they hear it, if it's exposed exposure. to them, it's exposure. Sometimes yeah. they're going to love it. Sometimes I think, it, I think, I think it's the, I, I just, I always put it at the industry does a very good job at promoting uh, uh, and pro- projecting the versions it prefers exactly. so that 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 it, it just limits the exposure that but i think that yeah so i mean and, got anyway I, the exposure but yeah sometimes like my kids my my kids have been exposed to my music their whole life my daughter my oldest daughter she's very eclectic she listens to all me and her got a very similar playlist right my mm-hmm. son though my oldest he <laughs> listens to everybody that i don't Right, right. And that's his influence. As a young black man, you know, he's into he's into what he likes. But the funny thing is, he'll come to me like maybe once every two months or so. He'll be like, Dad, I didn't know you made this. And he'll play something. He'll be like, yo, you were spitting on it. I'm like, boy, I've been spitting your whole life. Before. Exactly, exactly. <laughs> but you know, media, school, mm-hmm. peer groups. They 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 shaping your kid just as much as you are. You know what I mean. Mm-hmm. And that's why when I go into schools and I do these workshops, I always I always do that this activity where I tell them to name me your top five, and mm-hmm. they write down their top five. Right, super excited. Mm-hmm. They write down who they love, and it's always people like Polo G and Lil Dirk, and you know they they name in their five. I don't even know who they are. I yeah, know yeah. Who they and are. then I put mm-hmm. and some of their music is dope, but you gotta. For me, I gotta really dig through it. Like they gotta really point it out for me because I can't go through the whole thing trying to pick a diamond out. But after mm-hmm. they write their top five, I, I put three columns on a piece of paper. In the first column, I write these themes. I write God, school, jail, drugs, sex, money, etc. And then in the middle, I say, "What do your top five say about these things?" And they get all excited. They're like, "Can we curse?" I'm like, yeah, say whatever they say. So they write it all down. Little so-and-so said bitches ain't shit. None of us said, fuck it, I'll get more money, I'll blow the bag today. They write it all down. All like super excited because they're sharing and everybody said, What's that line that he said in the da da da? You know. <laughs> and then I wait till the last time. So after they get all of that out, we read it out and they share it all out. They're giggling because they get the curse and all of that. Then I get to the last column and I say, What does your mother, father, grandmama and them say about these things and then they write that down. then it gets quiet because now they're like Shit. <laughs> and they write it all down right and then at the yeah. end of it we look at it and i'm saying and i end up saying i always say to them in closing like i'm not saying your music is trash i'm just saying that your music is not aligned to the value system that you were raised with the music that you listen to tells you that bitches ain't shit. You ain't got to save your money. Fuck school. Jail ain't is, is something slight. Um, you know, all of these things. But when I ask you what your parents say, they tell you save your money. Don't have sex until you're an adult. Uh, go to school. Finish school. Don't go to jail. All the stuff that they telling you is the exact opposite. So you have to understand that this music is just entertainment. It is not 
your value system. These ain't words to live by. And y'all repeating them over and over and over again like that is having an effect on you. We used to tell C. Dolores Sucker she was crazy. But I told you. (laughs) She might be right. (laughs) Now let everybody clip that because that's a clip. Yeah. Somebody clip that. Yeah. Somebody clip because because just just because I had this this lovely debate with Davey D. Mm-hmm. I had done a a, a, a presentation at a and and I've written an article that was supposed to actually be it was it was supposed to go in as an introduction to Tucker's uh unpublished uh biography that her, her widow was gonna publish. I don't know whatever happened oh, to wow. that. But and but my argument was she wasn't perfect, but on this argument, this point, she was right. In the in the hip hop histor- historical narrative on this issue, got it wrong. Um, we, did. we did. Anyway, so I'm glad we listening to Tupac. We were listening to Tupac, and Tupac said, "Fuck C. Yeah, Dolores." And, and KRS, KRS said, "Fuck C. Dolores," and Eminem later said, "Fuck C. Dolores," and I mean, everybody was right. saying. Again, and look, this know. is what's crazy, and this is what again, this is what I mean by the Forrest Gump reference. I went to the press conference where C. Dolores Sucker made that speech. Well, one of her mm. speeches, she made a few, but I was at one where she was with Al Sharpton and somebody else, it was like at a press club or something. I was young, I, I might have been like a senior in college or just graduated, right? I go to this event and I'm in my mind like, man, these fucking old bogey motherfuckers, what the fuck they talking about, they don't know. I'm like on my Tupac shit, right? Mm-hmm. We leave, go to Union Station. We're in Union Station. We get in the elevator to go up to our um, to our car. Who's in the elevator? See Dolores Tucker and her husband. Just them two. So me and my boy, and them two. We get in the elevator. Boom! Hit the hit the button. They're fumbling on their phone, trying to figure out how they're going. This is before Uber and all that. Trying to figure out how they're going to get home. <laughs> And then my boy's like, you need a ride? And I'm like, hey, these motherfuckers are ride. <laughs> He's like, I need a ride. And I'm like, oh, my God. <laughs> in the car, right? This is a true story. Wow. We get in the car. They're in the back seat. We in the front. I got the screw face on. He's driving. They're talking. They're like, so what are you brothers into? So we telling them, you know, we go to school, blah, 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 blah. And my boy's like, yeah, I'm thinking about joining the Navy. And see, Lord Tucker's like, yeah, my husband was in the Navy for blah, 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 blah. He's retired now. She's, and he was like, you should do it, man. You'd be retired in 20 years, and you out of there. He was telling them all of this in the car, right? I ain't have the balls to step to him about the hip-hop stuff, so I just stayed quiet. <laughs> but it was the fact that they were in the car. All the way to the door. We get to their hotel. They get out. They're like, you lovely gentlemen. Have a, and she was so nice. So nice. I couldn't say nothing bad about it. But it was just that in my mind, I was against her. Cause I felt like she was assaulting hip hop. Little did I know hip hop was assaulting us the whole fucking time. And it's like hey. I about Cointel Pro and how it's be how this is we- being weaponized in a similar way. They looking at me like I'm crazy. And I'm like, dude, this is it's plain as day. I don't know how you can't see it. Like you see all these rappers getting caught up on Rico charges. They getting let back out and going in and doing whole sting operations on a whole community of people and getting locked up. You don't see, you think it was just Takashi? It's happening all through hip hop. There's people having gang wars, people getting killed. Hip hop has become the most dangerous profession in music. Mm. If you think about it, we've lost, I mean, we lost five people to murders in the last year. Mm. Five rappers, well known rappers, gunned down. Started with Nipsey two years ago. All the way to town, like all these, and so think about it. Like kids are following these artists. They love Pop Smoke. They love Young Dog. And then you wake up, and all over your Instagram feed, R.I.P. Young Dog got shot, killed, blah blah blah. That trauma is crazy. Mm-hmm. And so it was some other. It was some other young boy that music uh... and around the culture of the music. It's all. It's coming from all angles. Yeah. You know what I mean? So mm. those are the reasons why sometimes I'll be like. Man, I ain't even trying to do this shit no more. But at the same time, I'm like, I have to remind myself that, you know, my voice is important and somebody wants to hear it. Not not just myself, but 
it, I have to say it for someone else to hear it. You know what I mean? And I can't. I want to hear it. I can't get all in the weeds with all of that. What they doing? I'm raising my hand. Doing. Yeah, yeah. I want to hear it. Right. So I want to hear it. Kabai, go ahead. You were, you were about, about to jump in. Yeah. No, I was just going to say there was another young rapper. I, I, a lot of these people I haven't even heard of. I Honestly, I hadn't even heard of Young Dolph. But there was another one just after him like a week or two ago uh, that yeah. got killed. You know, so it's just to your point. Mm -hmm. You know, it, it, it is. And I think and I think the point that you made before, before Dr. Uh, Ball, we talk about uh, um, Bell Hooks and people saying, you know, the, the Mama Remember didn't like it, so they don't like it. It was kind of like the same kind of point um, around Cedar Lois Tucker, you know, because KRS didn't like her. Because Tupac that's right. didn't like her, we didn't like it, and we didn't even know why we didn't like it until right. later. That's right. We found out what she actually said, right? And not what they said that she said. It was it's your like, grandma. I'm as guilty as you. Turn that's that right. Noise off. Right. That's, that's right. How we interpret it. Book. That was a filter. <laughs> that's right. That was a filter. And and yep. so so whether it's the fifth tenet of the counterintelligence program that specifically said that black youth must be turned away from black nationalism uh, mm -hmm. by any means necessary was essentially what they were saying. Uh, or or whether it's things like, you know, this was the point I was trying to bring up with Davey D, that, that, that uh, Jeff Chang and other scholars have, and historians have literally uh, um, truncated and erased and misrepresented what Tucker was saying, even as they retell the history in their history books. So it's, it, the, the mythology about her is retold and, and it, it sort of institutionalized as bad hip hop history. So when you go to Can't Stop, Won't Stop, and this is part of what I was writing about, he literally cuts off her Senate testimony uh, uh, and, and other statements to, to, to present the, the mythological picture of her being against hip hop. Uh, when it, and, and when you read the whole thing, she's saying exactly what you're talking about is happening right now. Corporations have taken over the, 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 the art. They're projecting the worst forms that are having the worst impacts on our youth that are being used to not only uh, um, uh, encourage this kind of behavior that you're talking about, mm -hmm. but then a, a further repression from the state. Because then everybody right. says, look at these young, they all, look at, look at them. Now we got to come in and lock them all. And she literally even said, get rid of prisons and open up more schools. Uh, I mean, she was literally saying that. And everybody, true, myself included at the time, yeah. was like, oh, yeah. shut up. And she was challenging, yeah, and she was challenging the board. She was, was challenging wrong, the corporation. Man. She yeah. wasn't just challenging the rappers. She was challenging the corporations Corporate. themselves. That's right. And the, and the rappers, in trying to defend themselves, were actually, yeah. in effect, protecting the corporation right you know they were defending the corporation and right. she was saying no we need to get on these boards we need to you know target them and all these other things so she was Absolutely. making some real serious points and, and look and to this day there's still remnants of any anybody that has a criticism of hip-hop they still got to deal with that pushback mm -hmm. you can't have no criticism of hip-hop and i feel like at this point i'm not well versed in this uh afro pessimism thing i'm uh -oh. intrigued by it <laughs> I'm not well versed, <laughs> but there needs to be that version for hip hop. There needs to be a, mm -hmm. a Afro hip hop pessimism that needs to go on, so people understand. Like, yeah, there's the beauty and the glory of hip hop, but some of this shit is like, come on, man, y'all got to really like. Let's be if we gonna really talk about. It, let's really talk about. It. Like, nobody wants to talk about Bambada, for example. Oh, we have man. to talk about it if we, we gonna, do have to. We gonna be real. We have to have yeah. those conversations. But people are not, you know, we we romanticize it so much sometimes that we try to like. Yeah. Look past. I was shocked when I heard KRS One say, "Bam right. Bada is above reproach. He is above he any." Right. I know. And I was looking at KRS like, "Are you crazy?" Like, that's right too for KRS is saying that. <laughs> so that's right too. He was I just think that we have to. <laughs> we got to look at this stuff differently, man. We just got to keep it real, and, and we yeah. can't sugarcoat it, especially the ones that's been in it. You can't, we, if yeah. we're going to really preserve it and have it for down the road, we have to tell the whole story. And right now, our kid, the version of hip hop and what our kids think hip hop is, is not anywhere near what we know it to be. And we got to remember, it's only 40, 50 years old. That's right. We're not talking about a 300 year legacy. We're talking about something that's still in its yeah. infancy and still young enough that we can still shape the narrative. It ain't too gone where we got to try to pull it back. We can still, but we got to be real with it, man. And I think right now it's a lot of it is out of our hands. It ain't, I don't even know what to call that shit. 
Listen, the 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 so so two things because uh, um, uh, unfortunately we do need to to wrap here in a couple of minutes. Uh, uh, unfortunately, uh, and it's my fault, really. Um, uh, otherwise, we could keep going. It's just that uh, you know, like we were saying, the rest of the world wants to to interfere. You know, yeah, keep, yeah. keep imposing itself on. But but two things at least going away from today. One. And then I do have one more question for you, but 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 one we're going to um, uh, Kaba and I are going to to uh, um, uh, uh, um, destroy you in spades on your first podcast. Yeah, no, I don't and say. the other thing that I want to say publicly that I'm going to I want to like to help arrange now that you mentioned it. One, I would like for you to check out our interview with Frank Wilderson about Afro pessimism, okay. and then I am going to. Uh, uh, I'm not even going to ask your permission. I'm just going to say I'm going to try to put you in touch with him. And have you have I don't know come up with the yeah. initial Afro pessimistic pessimism trap uh, <laughs> that go. you can launch this new initiative? <clears throat> so Let's so I, that'll be my so that's my promised contribution. Uh, but which leads me to this last question, which is because what what I'm suggesting and and encouraging here is this combination of what you've been doing for a long time, which is this art. And, uh, uh, and the art and the educational piece with guerrilla art uh, and, 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 and elsewhere. Uh, you may have already been doing that a little bit, but could you say a little bit about that work and, and, yeah. and what its goal is uh, and maybe what, what's, what the latest is with it? Uh, well, you know, guerrilla arts was started in 20, 2005, 2006. Um, and our goal was to recruit, train and hire the local arts community, pull from our local arts community and have them serve as teaching artists in school. So passing along these transferable skills of being a DJ, a muralist, a theater person, a beat producer, MC, whatever. So we were having our, our local arts peer group serving in schools. And um, it allowed the artists to still travel and do what they needed to do and at the same time pay their bills by giving some time back to the kids and getting paid through that that function. So that's kind of how we started. Um, but the goal has always been to, for me, has always been to revolutionize the way we do teaching and learning, period, just mm. across the board. And so that's why we created the Hip Hop Educational Literacy Program, that series of books. Um, fast forward to now, we have a digital app. It's called the Opus app. Uh, if you go to theopus.app, it's a, a lesson plan builder that lets you make culturally responsive lesson plans in like five clicks. So we save and teach mm. two hours of planning just by messing with this app and making a lesson plan. So yeah, that's up. That's running right now. Um, and I'm working with uh, Outer Space Labs, which is this venture to uh, create outdoor learning labs made out of uh, reusable shipping containers. So we're taking these containers and creating like, like, maker labs where they can do drone fly drones or do um, 3d printing or make a podcast or record a song they could do it but these outdoor kind of spaces our first one is going in potomac gardens in the community in their uh in their neighborhood we're working with dc housing authority and doing that so now going from making new curriculum to transforming the spaces that we're going to be teaching in and then really democratizing who can teach who, mm. who can teach because we got teachers with all the training and master degrees in the world, and I never put my child in front of them. And then I got this other guy who didn't even go to college, but he's passionate about his art. He's been doing it for 20 years, he or her, he or she. And I would love to put my child in front of them because that's they're meeting someone who actually has a passion for something, you know? And I think that's the whole goal with what we're doing is how do we turn the lights on for these kids? We can't run around saying we got to save the babies. That's not our job. Our job is to turn the light on and then they can save themselves. You know what I mean? And so that's always what we try to try to push with every artist that we work with. Um, and all of the people, like a lot of the people we named on this, even on this, like Mamuna, Youssef, um, Head Rock, um, W. Ellison Felton, uh, Raheem. All of these different folks at some point have come through guerrilla arts as a teaching artist. Not to say that we put them on, but I just mean in the capacity of them sharing their talent and bringing it to the kids. Substantial, Kokai, RBI, I mean, the list goes on and on. 
But I was really just pulling from our peer group and saying, yo, these are who your teachers are. This is who y'all need to put these kids in front of. And so um, that's kind of been my model since then, man. And so now between the outdoor classrooms, the app, um, I'm still writing. I'm still trying to finish this book. As you know, I told you my my struggle with that. So that's coming. That's almost done for real this time. Well, good, good. And then and then I'm working with this organization, a long talk. And uh, and you and I right should on. talk about this because I know you probably may have a strong opinion about it. Um, but it's an <laughs> anti-racism experience that we do. It's a three-day call, and um people from all over the country, man, get on this call to talk about the the history and legacy of racism in this country and mm. why white supremacy takes no days off and why we gotta fight to be actively anti-racist. And it's not like in a in a wishy-washy preaching to the choir kind of thing. It really, the, the name of the organization, it really is a long talk about the uncomfortable truth. And that uncomfortable truth is what we get into in that call. So it's a lot of tears, it's a lot of frustration, it's a lot of anger. I'll definitely send you the link for the next call, man. Please just jump on and, and just to watch, sure. watch how it goes down. But we got people, yeah, yeah, yeah. athletic departments all over the country are involved. They just met with Deutsche Bank. So now they're like banks getting involved and <laughs> corporations and people who are trying to find ways that they can use their dollars and their influence to actively be anti-racist. And I know I've had reservations in the past about it's not black people's job to teach white people how to be anti-racist. Trust me, I did that. But after going through the experience, I realized like, no, this is, we, we are, we're doing a different level of chess right now. And I want you to see it so we can talk about it offline. Um, hey, man, it's, of course. it's an amazing experience. You may be getting a call hey, from that, that judge. Oh, go ahead. What'd you say? You, you, you may be getting a call from that judge in Louisiana that got caught, you know. With the, what judge? With the in, she got caught for using the N-word oh. bomb. Snark, storm, oh, I saw that. I, I saw that. Wait, yeah, yeah, but did yeah, you yeah. see the judge in Philly? This was a couple years ago. The judge in Philly that got caught sending all those kids up to upstate for, for pay. Yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. yo, they yeah. they overturned four thousand cases, bro. Yeah, he got a million dollars over ten years to send mm -hmm. four thousand kids up. Mm -hmm. Children, yeah, oh, and white and kids too. Judge. By the way, he was sending white yeah. kids up there. Oh yeah, he was, I, he was I, getting I everybody. Yeah, 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 a lot of those judge. kids. In fact, one of the stories I saw, uh, it was a white woman who who accosted him outside of one of his court cases because she was saying, because her son killed himself uh, after getting locked up and having his life ruined over some nonsense. And she she went at, she tried to attack him coming out the courtroom. Mm -hmm. I don't understand you killed my son. how you operate, man. You saw the judge, with, uh, what's the boy they just got off? Rittenhouse. Rittenhouse, his judge. Mm -hmm. Oh, yeah. yeah. And yeah. then the girl, who shot my man in the, um in his apartment? What was that cop's name? Amber or something? Oh yeah, yeah. I don't remember her name, but yeah, Amber, yeah. But uh, if you watch him in his own apartment, watch that trial. Mm -hmm. A lot of weird stuff was happening, man. I know. Oh, John, both them, John, both them, John, both them, John. Yeah, rest who? By the right. way, my my nieces, my nieces actually knew him. They went to school with him in college. By the way, oh, I have wow. twin nieces. Well, actually, they're like my cousins' niece, children, but I call them my nieces. Yeah. You know what mm -hmm. I noticed about that oh, trial? Wow. Though? That judge was, that that lady that was incredibly empathetic to her, she gave mm -hmm. her a Bible at the end and hugged her. Right, mm -hmm. right. But you don't, I don't know if y'all ever peeped this though. There was one point in the trial when, the, when, when Amber is sitting in the chair, she's sitting in her chair and the bailiff. Yeah, I saw that, the black bailiff. The black bailiff. Yeah. Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> 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 yeah, the black bailiff. I'm like, what kind of shit is this, man? What is going on in these courthouses, man? She was literally like, like she had, she was like, pull, like, like, like helping her with her hair, man. I could not understand what bailiff does that. I don't know. That was crazy. I remember that though. You're right. We in that a was simulation crazy. for real, man. That's all I'm saying. We, we oh, okay, we in the metaverse for real. You in the metaverse. <laughs> <laughs> hey, on that note, we're gonna leave it there, man. Asheru, thank you very much, man. We 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 we'll you, be in man. touch in a few minutes. Yeah. Uh have to have you back on uh, very soon, brother Kaba. Thank you very much. 
Thank you. Shout out to our man. I love to have y'all. We're going to see you soon. Yeah, man. We're all going to see you. Don't be mad. Don't be mad. I'm just telling you. Don't be mad. Don't be mad. Tell me in advance. You know, get better. Peace to. Peace to Dr. Niasha. Peace to you, Ashru. Everybody in the Peace. chat. Everybody going to see this later. We'll catch you next time here at I Mix What I Like. Peace if you're willing to fight for it, like Fred Hampton used to say. Catch you next time here. Peace, everybody. Thanks again. I mix what I like, what I like, what I like, what I like, what I like.